Hello and welcome here for our first Tell Me More About session. For the next 20 minutes, we will try to find out as much as we can about the future of bioprinting with this guest, Bilal Al Nawaz from Germany. And remember, this session is on channel one, so we're live, which means that at any time you can submit your questions and I will relay your questions on your behalf. Now, Bilal is now joining us live from Germany. Um, good evening, Bilal, can you hear us? Yes, hello, yeah, good there evening, you are. I can hear nice you. Nice to see you. From where are you joining us tonight? I'm joining you from Mainz, which is located in the center of Germany, close to Frankfurt. And it's really a pleasure to be part of the Digital Days. I'm really proud of that. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, we're very glad that you're still able to join us tonight via this live connection. Um, you are a professor at both the U University of Mainz in Germany and a guest professor at the Kiyung Hee University School of Dentistry in Seoul, Korea. But more importantly, perhaps in this context, is that in April of this year, you organized for the fourth time already the International Conference on 3D Printing in Medicine. So please explain to us, what is bioprinting and why is it important for us to know more about it? Yeah, perhaps we can have a look at a slide here. So I will share my screen with you. Um, here it is. Yeah, so 3D printing technology, we better have to say additive manufacturing, means that we have materials and living cells together, which are put layer by layer. This is the important thing which you see here. And we call often, we often call this material the bio ink. Um, and actually it's about 20 years old. In 2000, the bioengineer Thomas Boland used an old Lexmark printer to print collagen. So actually it was a real printing technology. And I like the quote from an author, Stephen Leckard, who said, welcome to the age of bioprinting, where the machines we've built are building bits and pieces of us. So it shows interestingly what happens. So what has been done is that these cells are, are mixed with a bio ink and using different techniques put layer by layer on top of something. So you can build up a real architecture. That is what changes things. So of course, people think of organs. So I have the picture here of Adam Feinberg's group and the Israeli group from the Veer, um, who published something about printing an artificial heart. But you can imagine how difficult this is. So this is more like science fiction, still a lot of work. Perhaps we are thinking of tissue reconstruction, like uh, the nice work from Rasparini in 2015, where we think of regenerating bone. We will hear much more about this this evening. But what is already happening is 3D printing of tissue in vitro. So for oncology or for drug screening. So there are a lot of different things. The main idea behind this is that we can scale up blood vessels. So you can print blood vessels and use them to organize functioning organs. So this is the main idea behind bioprinting. Exactly. Well, that sounds very exciting. But for our viewers who are watching this session in recording at a later time, we should state that we are now talking in October 2020. How far is at this point the development of bio bioprinting? Where are we? Yeah, let's have a look here into the next picture, if it's coming. It is. Yeah, so we started with the digital world. We, we have the 3D forms already, and this is what we need for bioprinting also. You need STL files. And then people started with acellular techniques. So this was the first start, and you already see some of the materials which are used as bioprinting cell inks. And then the passive scaffolds came, like you see here a hydroxy appetite uh, printed. Um, material. And the next step, of course, is then incorporating cells with this and printing little organic-like structures. And during the conference we had in mind, we already saw mus muscle tissue, which was pumping already like heart tissue or functioning thyroid tissue, which was re-implanted into mice. So you see the organoids are already working a little bit. Wow, that's, that's super exciting. Now, certainly for those people who are entirely new to this topic, we're going super fast. You just gave us an overview of the applications. Can you describe to us the general methods? How does it work? Yeah, actually, what you need is an idea of your organ. So you need 3D images of the organ, and this is not easy. You can imagine when the blood vessels are very thin, 
it's very difficult to gather this information. So people also have to use mathematics, how to come back to these organ or vascular trees. So this is very important. The other aspect is then you have to transform this into STL files. So this is computer work, actually. Um, this is also something which is very important. And what I like then is the term nesting. You have to think of how to put this into the 3D printer. Sometimes you need supporting structures who hold up something. And that's why sometimes different inks are used. And then you can cross-link your ink together remove the support structures, and then you come to the real situation. So you see, there's a lot of thinking behind it and a lot of different methods. So people use classical extrusion printers where things are just pumped up like in a syringe or inkjet printers. I don't want to go too deep into these details, but you can imagine there are different techniques behind it. Exactly. Now you mentioned the different type of inks. Why are the inks so important? Yeah, people think nowadays that the inks are the main key to the point. Um, so here's the picture of a 3D printing company. Um, and you see a vascular system which is built. Um, and you can imagine it's very difficult. You cannot build this up just like in air. So you need a support structure, a structure which is left out afterwards. Um, so you have the matrix where the cells are in which is often made of gelatine, alginate, or collagen. This depends on what you want to print, what type of material. You have support inks, which give the mechanical structure, which is perhaps like PCL or PLGA. These are the materials we already know from tissue engineering. And sometimes around them, you have a kind of sacrificial ink, which is put away perhaps by melting procedures after the printing. So you see, Finding the right ink, which works in the body, which gives a lot of structure, which also is biocompatible, seems to be the clue for this point. Yeah, indeed. And it seems that we need a lot of them for different type of applications. Now, this sounds all very exciting. And I can imagine that our dentists and clinicians who are watching from all over the world now all want to get their hands on this in their own clinic. But what is currently the status of bioprinting in clinical applications? Yeah, perhaps we can have a look a little bit uh, for the challenges, I think. So you have to think you need a potent cell line. You have to find out the cell line. Then you have to handle your cell line. It gets into contact with the ink and it should still work. So you have biological questions. Then you have the material. You have to have an ink which is printable, which has to have certain mechanical properties, print parameters, support structures. And this both comes together and you have the application. You have to see, are the cells still viable when they come out? Do they behave like the cells we want? And then you have to go into the toxicity and find out, does this all work? And think of the immunologic issues. You are not really allowed to use xenorganic material when you want to replant this into the human situation. It should be all uh, autologous. And the regulatory issue is also something which is really interesting. Is this a biomaterial? How can we bring into market this? So organs are still far away, but patches, small parts of material might be interesting. We already see patches of nerve tissue, of blood vessels. I think this is the most promising part. And also skin and perhaps bone is starting a little bit. So we are really close ahead of the materials which come now into the animal to the in vivo situation. All right, so, so from an engineering and a scientific viewpoint, we are relatively nearby. What, what are some of the possible future applications that you see of bioprinting? Uh, this is, um, I think, one of the most interesting questions. There's, there's every week you're reading something new. I like the idea that bioprinters become democratic. They are already cheap. And you can even load, download some um, applications like open source to print your own bioprinter. So it's not something which is really expensive. The other question which I like a lot is, do we really need cells? So when we think of a blood vessel, the cells are recruited from the blood itself. So perhaps the first steps where we see this coming into the in vivo situation will be situations where we do not need cells and the cells are recruited by the material itself. And the other thing is perhaps is not wise to have the printer here and then bring it to the operation theater. There are groups like Ibrahim Otsbolat and they are working on in situ bioprinting. That means you directly print 
in the operation room, like um, you see the, the, the syringe for gluing. Yeah? Um, this is real science fiction. And the most interesting part, which is also interesting for dentistry, is the so-called 4D bioprinting. That means you have inks or materials who do something after a certain stimulus. So you can think they are changing their shape. They are, they are putting out some antibiotics or other things. So this is really um, the most promising part. And just um, last week, I saw um, Professor Mironov. He was also in, in Mainz at the conference. Um, and he brought his bioprinter to space, to the ISS. Um, and they, they tried to print there. Perhaps you can think of food or meat and all these things. So there are a lot of points for bioprinting. Exactly. So uh, this is this is really entering our new reality now, and this is very closely related to a viewer question that we are uh, coming in. If you're just joining us, make sure you take the make the most of this time together with Professor Bilal Al Nawaz and send in your questions. Question is from I don't have a name here, but it says, are there already some three D bioprinters bio on the market? Yeah, not really for the in vivo use. I know that some, in, at least in Germany, we have some materials which have a CE marking, but not already with cells. Um, so most of the applications are still organ patches for organ testing like skin um, or like liver tissue for the pharmaceutical in industry, but not for the in vivo use. But the problem is the cell. Yeah, yeah. And, and what do you think is the first thing that we as dentists will see bioprinted in our practices? Will it be augmentations with soft tissue, hard tissue? Where do you think we come across this? Perhaps soft tissue is even more uh, challenging because there's a lot of work being done on skin and skin is rather thin. Um, so perhaps the, the vascularization is much easier than when we think of bone or even teeth. Um, so, so the mucosa perhaps is much more challenging uh, or much more promising to, to see for bioprinting uh, than the bone itself. So in the dental world, I think this, this might be more interesting. Interesting. And then obviously we all want to know, what does it cost? I see a viewer question coming in also. What is the cost of a bioprinted product compared to the current marketed pro uh, products? Yeah, actually, it's not a product yet. Um, so we are still in the research phase. And I think uh, the interesting point is that even if you are a re researcher with a small budget, you can start to work with bioprinting. Um, if you want to use it in the clinical setting, it is not yet um, close to the market. It's far away from that. Um, the first step we will see is the shape the printed shape of, let's say, bone reconstructions. There are a lot of people working on that. And the cellular aspect will come later. Okay, so that's, that's clear guidance of what, what to look for. The questions are really coming on now, so let me read out another one. Um, the question is, how long would it take to cultivate a patient's cells before printing its own product, right? Because we, we talk about the different gels and materials, but maybe yeah. it's best to print our own cells. I think this is the goal. Um, the problem is, of course, that you have to have a GMP lab, so which is uh, certified. The, the, this is rather expensive. And we learned from the old materials which have been on the market that, that you will use some weeks until you come back into the clinical setting. So you cannot go directly next week to the operation theater. So usually you talk about weeks of the 3D processing of the cells. But the autolog cell is definitely the one where we think things will happen in the next years. Exactly. Now, if, if people get curious, obviously they need to keep track of your uh, 3D printing uh, conf in medicine conference in the next few years, but what is currently the leading center of research and expertise in this field of bioprinting? Ah, there are several heads doing very interesting things. So I like Adam Feinberg's work uh, about the heart because he starts really with the collagen structures, with functional flaps, um, with, with the blood vessels, with the muscles, and the same group from Israel around RV. Ibrahim Otsbolat working on bone, and we will have a great um, discussion this evening also with my colleague from Finland. So there are a lot of important people and they, they really dig deeper into the points. So it's not one single group working on it. Exactly. And, and in terms of logistics, eh, how do you see this in the future? Will you see that we all in the, as dentists have a, a bioprinter in our own clinic? Or will we have centers of expertise that serve regionally? How, how do you see this come to, to life in the practice? Yeah, this is um, the real question about additive manufacturing, because um, 
the way will change that we are not manufacturing something centralized. We see this also with the titanium plates that we, we might think of remote manufacturing. Um, and the same might happen with the bioprinting so that the large centers will develop the expertise. You have to, to work in the GMP surroundings and, and this will be reserved for certain big centers, but you will not transport these cells across Europe, I think. This will be done a little bit more remotely. Okay, sounds very interesting. I'm looking at my, uh, my desk if I see if we have had a, any other uh, viewer questions. Um, uh, but um, uh, not yet right now, so let me invite you once again to send in your questions. Um, again, what do you think is the, the next step? Who should we keep an eye on if we want to uh, have bioprinting in our offices soon? And yeah, I think we should, we should follow a little bit the, the interesting groups who really do something. Um, because they, they really publish a lot. And um, from my point of view, still bone regeneration is something which is interesting because we learn a lot about that. We will hear a lecture about this today. Um, at the osteology, people are doing a lot in this field. Um, so you really have to keep an eye open. And most of the things are open source. So I can really recommend you to read one of the articles from Adam Feinberg's group or from Avery's group about printing the heart, because then you learn a little bit how the efforts are running and, and how challenging the whole topic is. Interesting. Well, uh, so I think it's important that we recap the most important take-home messages. Can you summarize what you really want people to memorize from this Tell Me More About Bioprinting? Yeah, I think it's important to know that the, the bio-ink seems to be the clue or the combination of different bio-ink seems to be the clue. And we have to understand that bioprinting is not only about printing an organ, printing a heart, or we see the ear, is also printing of little patches. And this is where perhaps we in dentistry will use it, bone patches or skin patches or combinations. And also the in vitro situation testing this, reducing animal experiments. So bioprinting is much broader than we even think of. But people also have to know that there are certain regulatory issues before we come into the human situation. So there still is a lot of work to do. And for us, um, when we discuss this during the conference, we were all convinced that people should take their time stepwise before bringing this into the human situation and having perhaps problems there and killing the whole technique. So it takes some time, the miracle. Wow, thank you. And I hope you were all taking notes. Thank you very much, Professor Bilal Al-Nawaz, live with us from Germany. A pleasure. And thank you, all you members of the audience, for your active participation so far. Now, in case you just submitted a question which did not yet get answered, you can now continue in our chat with our expert Bilal Al-Nawaz and all the other participants in our Channel 8 Tell Me More After Discussions chat lounge.